-hmm. Okay, so uh, as a, a program director of uh, Answer Query program, and also uh, the principal investigator uh, of uh, Answer Create in Edison, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you and thank you for coming here to attend the uh, uh, Answer Create uh, Sunni seminar. Uh, the, talk, uh, the speaker for today is uh, Stanley Liang. Uh, Stanley uh, is a PhD student in computer science and also a trainee of our Answer Create program in Edison at York University. Uh, on a scholarship and fellowship sponsored by the Department of Energy in US, uh, he has the internship uh, consecutively uh, in 2016 to 2017 summer uh, in the NIH where he uh, design and implement a mobile uh, neural network uh, system for early alarm of ma malaria, which is also the topic for, for the day. And Stanley got his master's degree from School uh, of Information Technology in Master of uh, Information System and Technology. And uh, uh, his thesis uh, was recommended as the best thesis award uh, last year. So let's welcome Stanley uh, for his talk. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Today I would like to present my research on deep learning for uh, enhancing early alarm of uh, infectious disease uh, pre pandemic. Uh, this application is based on the uh, state-of-the-art deep learning algorithm. Uh, uh, specifically convolution neural network to detect and classify um, uh, visual patterns that can use for automatic diagnosis and based on this technology we successful to establish a system based on the uh, Android system that can be deployed to any Android mobile device to do uh, automatic uh, malaria diagnosis and the uh, sample classifications. So uh, my study and my research is funded by uh, Answer uh, Edison program. I'm a, I'm a trainee in science and uh, we have uh, established a partnership with the U.S. National Institute of Health uh, for this uh, malaria program that will be uh, apply to resource pool region for malaria control, mainly in Africa and in South Asia. And my supervisor is Professor Jimmy Huang, who is also the uh, project uh, director and PI. And uh, this research is also uh, partly funded by the uh, NIH Intramuna funding in Basista, uh, the Basista campus of uh, NIH in the year 2016 and 2017. So uh, let's go to some detail. So uh, emergency early alarm system is very important and can play a significant role to so many applications including uh, fire alarms, including uh, like chronic disease, uh, emergency, uh, like uh, the uh, famous device for uh, heart disease. And we also uh, can detect like, some kind of attack by uh, terrorism uh, with uh, biochemical toxins and is very useful to um, disaster management like earthquake, fire, etc. Uh, based on the uh, technology of uh, artificial intelligence and also on uh, mobile device and big data, nowadays uh, the uh, early alarm systems uh, not only can be deployed on uh, the most significant place like airports, like university campus, but it can also to become portable. That means we can deploy the programs that provide emergency early alarm functions in smartphones, like uh, in an Android device or a 
iOS device that can have the uh, similar function as the uh, conventional device that is mainly deployed on uh, public place like airport, like uh, university campus, and etc. And why we choose malaria? Because malaria is a Asian but still very dangerous disease, mainly transmitted by a paralysis called posmodium. Uh, uh, when the patient is bite by infected mosquitoes, that means mosquito carrying malaria, the human will be affected. And according to the annual report of a World Health Organization, about uh, two. Uh, 214 million new patients is affected annually uh, uh, with about uh, 438,000 deaths per year. Therefore, malaria is still a major burden of global health. And here the photo show about the uh, regions in the world that has a severe malaria infection, including Africa, uh, including uh, South America, including uh, South Asia, etc. And the middle is uh, some kind of mosquito net uh, in the kindergartens in Kenya because uh, the most effective uh, prevention for malaria is uh, cut the, uh, uh, the media of transmission. That means uh, protect the children from mosquito bites. And here is the chart uh, showing us how malaria is transmitted and affect human, mainly from mosquito bites. Uh, the plasmodium will be injected to human body, and through blood circulation, eventually the plasmodium will be will go into the red blood cells and start to uh, generate more uh, parasites. After that, uh, the new generations of the malaria will go out of the um, red blood cells that will cause many severe symptoms on human body including high fear, including uh, like, uh, very severe liver failure or renal failure that will be usually lethal. That's why uh, this kind of disease is so dangerous. As one of the main uh, uh, threats to health globally, uh, this uh, uh, a lot of measure has been taken in our world to uh, protect humans from malaria infection. For example, the new Director General of the World Health Organization is Dr. Uh, Jeremy Yasses, who is a very famous uh, special uh, expert on mal malaria research. And just in the year 2015, a Chinese professor, Tao Youyou, who is believed as the mother of atomicillin, is won Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Uh, however, there's so many issues that uh, we still need further work, for example, for the uh, diagnosis of malaria, because it's now the conventional and classical diagnosis is mainly relies on live uh, microscopes, which has to be uh, operate by human or the technicians to count how many cell, uh, red blood cells is, is, are affected by malaria uh, when the number hit the uh, uh, diagnosis criteria the patient will, will be confer infection by the disease and there's also a picture showing uh, the uh, emergency and uh, and uh, and uh, infectious uh, department of hospital that there's new patients are moving in and actually the health providers and doctors uh, are working under very dangerous uh, circumstance because uh, they still have the risk to be uh, affected by the disease. So uh, based on uh, these conditions, uh, 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 our answer Edison program uh, build a partnership with uh, U.S. Uh, National Institute of Health to uh, enhance the malaria control in uh, resource poor regions like um, South Africa and South Asia, and also 
Uh, NIH has an intramural research uh, regarding applying uh, AI for malaria screening in the year 2015, that were, uh, the goal is to provide an uh, automatic diagnosis solution for malaria control, especially in the place that there's a lot of uh, new malaria case, but uh, still relies on manpower for diagnosis. Because uh, this disease is a global burden, however, in developed countries like in the US or in Canada, uh, the case is rare. So in our place, uh, the research focus on malaria is not very popular, but actually outside our country, in this world, um, this kind of research is very important to uh, global health and disease control. And our answer, uh, Anderson program team, uh, Anderson uh, research team, has participated in the research uh, project since the year 2016 and the aim of this, this research is to provide an automatic diagnosis uh, a smartphone app uh, to uh, as a as the uh, solution the software to screen the uh, blood smear uh, collect from patients uh, as the basis for the diagnosis and our program is uh, successful to develop such an AI solution based on the uh, new uh, deep learning technology uh, for uh, visual protein detection and image recognition. And here we see that uh, I, my participation of the NIH uh, summer research program in the year uh, 2016, uh, 2016 in 17 in the uh, Bethesda campus of NIH and our app has been deployed to some labs for testing. Here is a, a scientist from Thailand who is using the app uh, on the smartphone that is connected to a light uh, microscope with an adapter. So when you put the um, blood sample uh, under the uh, observer, uh, the app will automatically count how many cells are infected in the microscopic view. And our initial study, uh, we published a paper in uh, last year uh, in the uh, IEEE BIBM conference. And also this year, uh, our research partner, Dr. Stefan Ager, participated in the big data conference uh, held by uh, Field Institute of uh, University of Toronto just in September to present the progress of our uh, collaborative uh, research. So first we need to know how deep learning works because this is the basic technology of our uh, AI solution. Uh, what's called deep learning is a deep neural network model with uh, many uh, hidden layers, usually more than two hidden layers. A deep learning, a deep neural network is a model to prefer deep learning uh, for uh, pattern recognition, detection, and segmentation. It provides the, uh, so far the best solution for unstructured data, such as uh, text recognition, image recognition, video detect, uh, detection, voice or sound recognition, and also natural language processing. Uh, you might know that there's some device like uh, launched by Amazon, like the Amazon Echo, actually can you ask the, uh, let the machine to talk and communicate with human. This is uh, still a very promising uh, field uh, of the deep learning application. So, on uh, the graph on. So the, the graph on the left uh, illustrates a neuron in the network. Uh, so uh, a neuron in the, uh, uh, in the network uh, is, it will compute all the neuron from the previous layer and then send the waves to it. And inside the neuron, all the waves uh, sent uh, from the further neuron layer will be uh, submit it and then we use an activation function to compute the output of these neurons and this is uh, show uh, and the picture on the uh, on the right to show you how 
uh, this uh, computation actually occurs. So there's uh, basically two steps. The first step is get a sub. The second step is, is choose an activation function and use the activation function to uh, generate the output of these neurons. Um, based on this, there's uh, many choices. For example, here we use a sigmoid function and we can also use uh, many uh, different types of functions like the uh, uh, rectified linear units. That's quite famous and common in uh, visual recognition. And we can also use other functions like hyperbolic uh, tangent, etc. So uh, the basic learning procedure of a neural network is so-called the feedforward and back propagation process. Uh, the feedforward means we compute the value of each layers from the input to the output. So the the computation is quite intuitive because it simply sub up all the value sent to a neuron from the uh, for, for, uh, former layers and the uh, back probation uh, stage is that we compute the volume uh, reversely from the uh, output layer to the uh, input layer by based on the uh, loss function that means the difference between the, the true value and the uh, predicted value so in this stage, we mainly use uh, partial derivative from one layer to a layer, which means uh, from the output layer, uh, we, we look at the next layer closer to the input layer. And for each neuron, for example, here for K, it has value sent, uh, Send uh, from the two green neurons from the output uh, from the output layer. So we take these two inputs and compute the derivative. Uh, by this method, we, we we can set the goal to uh, minimize the error and let the uh, neural network model to to not to, to learn the patterns from the training data. So. Next, we're going to optimize our deep neural network model. Uh, for any machine learning algorithm, the two problems through the computation is uh, overfitting and underfitting. To solve the issue of um, underfitting is simple. We simply replace for a better performance model. However, the overfitting issue is kind of tricky because that means uh, the learning capacity of the model is too good and it can learn every detail from the training data so the, the learning result cannot be uh, generalized for new data. So in order to do this, uh, basically we have uh, many choices. For example, we can choose a appropriate learning rate, that means uh, for each step of learning, we can choose the appropriate uh, uh, length of step that we will not overpass the uh, true or the true global minimum. Another uh, strategy is use the stochastic gradient descent. That means we don't need to we don't need to compute the uh, gradient uh, from the whole learning uh, training data, but we can use uh, sampling technology to uh, randomly get a sample subset from the uh, whole tr uh, training set and compute the, uh, the gradient. The next uh, strategy is choose a proper activation function. This is totally based on what kind of data you're using. For example, uh, for uh, numeric data training, probably we can choose sigmoid. For um, image data learning, we can choose a recti rectified linear unit or VLU. If we choose uh, a recurrent neural network for like voice recognition or uh, natural language processing, probably we can choose hyperbolic tangent. This, this depends on what kind of data you're using. So in our solution, 
uh, we mainly use uh, Vidu because we are processing uh, image data. <coughs> so this is how uh, stochastic gradient descent works. Uh, the concept of uh, stochastic gradient descent is uh, comparable to the concept of batch gradient descent because in uh, patch gradient descent, uh, we compute the loss based on all the data in the training set and that will reach the uh, minimum in a very smooth curve. However, if each time we need to compute the, the gradient of, the, of all the data, if, uh, the, the runtime will be quite expensive. So in order to solve this problem, uh, we propose the uh, technique called stochastic gradient descent. There, so as you, I show here, each time we simply randomly choose a subset from the training set and compute the gradient of the subset. Uh, by this method, we can see that the, the, the pathway to the uh, true minimum will become more zigzag compared to the smooth uh, pathway of the uh, best gradient descent. However, theoretically, if it, we choose a appropriate learning rate uh, and use some technique to control the issue like gradient vanish and gradient expulsion, we can also, we can still reach the um, true minimum by much lower cost. That's the uh, strategy of uh, stochastic gradient descent. So another step is how to optimize the design. I mean the process. It's difficult to choose the best learning rate for uh, stochastic gradient design uh, because we need to make sure that the learning is converged. That means the, the value of the loss will keep approaching to zero. Uh, however, uh, to a certain stage, um, the converge will become uh, diverge because sometimes uh, it's very difficult to uh, reach lower cost value because of uh, many factors. For example, uh, here, if we choose a very high learning rate uh, for a certain epoch of computing, the loss will increase. If we choose a high compute rate, so the descent will, uh, the, the loss will descend in a relative, relatively uh, rapidly, uh, but uh, it won't hit, uh, but it will reach a divergence uh, earlier. If we choose a very low learning rate, uh, the gradient descent procedure will be much longer but more stable, but it's also very expensive for runtime. So the best uh, learning rate is that we can uh, get the descent of the loss in a acceptable speed, but it can, uh, and it can also reach a very low cost value that is quite close to zero. And there are many algorithms to optimize the gradient descent. Uh, for example, the earlier one is called Momentum, and there's a re revised version called Nostalf Momentum. And next is the um, Adagrat. This is in the 1990s. And the newest uh, methods include the, uh, the RMS proc, this, which is proposed by Jeffrey Hinton in 2012. And late, two years later, the Hindon group also uh, proposed a newer uh, method called um, ADAM, or Adaptive uh, uh, Momentum Estimation, which is uh, believed to be the best uh, SDG algorithm for uh, image learning. But uh, it depends, because based on our experience, IMS Pro <coughs> looks better because like Google, the, the robot for AlphaGo, they use the RMS Pro to, to train the model. And here's the picture to show you how these different algorithms work. Because uh, theoretically, 
uh, all this algorithm works. However, when the gradient descent hit a shadow point, that means a local minimum instead of the global minimum, uh, minimum a different algorithm, the speed of the descent will be different. Next, we talk about convolution neural network. Convolution neural network, or CNN, is a deep learning model, particularly designed for learning of uh, two-dimensional data, such as image or videos. A CNN model can fit with raw input and automatically uh, discover high-dimensional complexity image representations. This is an advantage because we don't need to uh, use a very complicated uh, data pre-processing technology uh, to exact to extract the uh, pattern from it. So here is a illustration of regarding how uh, uh, CNN works. Typically, is a conversion from a thin but large uh, array to a relatively smaller in the third two dimension but deeper uh, tensor by uh, by by repeating the uh, convolutional operations and the advantage of CNN is that we can skip a very complicated uh, data pre-processing stage so this is uh, how this works for a CNN model so a CNN is its unique feature is that uh, we need to design a lot of convolution layer to extract the visual patterns. But from the beginning, I mean the beginning and the last layers are actually a normal uh, neural network model. And the most uh, complicated part of this model is the uh, design of the um, convolution layers in the middle because we need to find a way to uh, effectively manipulate the data, I mean the size of the arrays and tensors, and we need to decide how many uh, fi uh, convolution filters are effective to uh, extract the visual patterns, because if you decide too many uh, convolution uh, filters, uh, there will be serious overfitting issues and many neurons will vanish because uh, the loss will become zero and they place uh, no uh, they, they, their, their rules to for classification is very low and it's a, a lot of waste of time and computation if we have two few uh, convolution filters we cannot effective to uh, extract all the uh, discriminable uh, visual patterns that will cause the issue like underfitting for, for, for our uh, whole CNN models. So here we talk about um, how convolution works. So the convolution operation is simply the uh, can be summed up to the uh, derivative of two functions because we use a, they use the Fourier series uh, to uh, because it's a periodic function we use it in different times to extract a the pattern in different um, uh, spatial position as I show here uh, so the image uh, first, we use the filter, convolution filter to fill out all the background noise and different convolution filter will pick the angles and edges in different directions based on the, com the whole computation because we take the whole derivative from uh, uh, minus infinity to positive infinity and when it uh, pulls the data forward to the uh, fully collect dense layers. All these uh, extract edges and visual patterns can be resampled to let the computer get enough uh, information for uh, pattern uh, classification. So, uh, 
here we show about how these things works uh, because when uh, the uh, the cause for the convolution computation is quite complicated so we need to figure out some methods to lower the cost for computation that's how people use uh, pooling layers pooling layer is simply uh, prefer a subsampling to reduce the size of the feature map or the tensor because like a two 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 to four times two to four um, tensor after pooling the size will be compressed uh, by uh, fifty percent and this usually there's two kinds of pooling strategy first is called average pooling because we get like for this patch from the uh, matrix we simply take the average of this four number as one in in in, in the output of the pooling uh, so because we're taking average so people think uh, this will be quite too expensive so for convenient way uh, it also has the so-called max pooling that means we simply compare the values in the patch of the matrix and simply take the biggest one this is called uh, max pooling max pooling is uh, theoretical cheap or can be a uh, kind of computing saving uh, but uh, theoretically uh, average pooling has better result than uh, max pooling and to generate to let the model generate learning we use uh, the activation functions activation functions are applied between two convolution layers to generate learning and for a CNN, we usually use a non-linear non functions such as a hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, or rectified linear units. Uh, it can because uh, we use Miller can uh, greatly accelerate the convergence of the stochastic grade descent procedure, and because it only surpass all values uh, equals zero and less than zero to zero it can uh, it can uh, significantly lower the computing cost and it can easily suppress neurons by replacing any negative input by zero so the dyed neurons uh, cannot be uh, reactivated so uh, after the visual plugins are extracted uh, by a series of uh, convolutional operations we need to pipeline the output of the convolutional layer to the fully connect layers which is contain neurons that connect to the entire input uh, values as other uh, neural, neural networks a typical setting of output layer consists of a series of fully connect layers and ends with a Softmax function as the output of the probability to uh, different uh, classes. The softmax layer resolves the probability regarding the conditional probability of the given class, also known as the normalized uh, exponent, which uh, can be considered as the multi class generation of the logistic. Um, sigma function if we only do binary classification but uh, usually we will use the softmax function as the output layer because uh, if you use a sigmoid function for binary classification which means uh, only class have two classes uh, sometimes there will be some issues like if the program I mean uh, if the following code will pick 0 and 1, but the output is 1 and 2. For example, it's only two class. That will make some bugs in your program. So because the um, softmax function can be used for both uh, binary classification and for um, multi-class classification, so you only use the uh, softmax function can be one solution to prevent some troubles. Uh, for implement a solution for deep learning. That's my uh, 
personal experience because um, in some uh, software package like in Java, there's some issues of of uh, zero and one and one and two because uh, for uh, softmax function the output is one and two, and in sigma is always zero and one. So the code after the classifier cannot understand when the output is zero and one because some bugs probably they collect it nowadays, but um, at least in in in, in August uh, the bugs still there. So we used almost a week to figure out this, this error. So based on this lesson, we continue use uh, softmax and we skip the um, sigma function. Next is how we configure our uh, our model, CNN model. So now people prefer to use uh, the uh, residual net which formed by the Visilia block model in order to solve the problem of uh, gradient vanish because instead of uh, output the uh, value of the activation function the Visilia net also act the uh, original input as the to the output in order to make the gradient large enough because if the output is too small uh, you will find that the loss function become log of zero because it's uh, not a number because it's too small. So in many uh, deep learning libraries, uh, uh, you still have this problem because uh, usually a model should run like 10 to 20 APOS. If you observe the loss output is stable, you, you, you will conclude that uh, the performance can no longer improve if the output become not a number you cannot observe what is going to happen inside the neural network because uh, the gradient descent will take several apos uh, usually 10 to 20 after it can be improved thoroughly so if you don't observe long enough like people some people prefer to set an early stop function for five apos uh, you will cut the learning too early. This is the uh, problem for uh, software engineering. And our model is simply a sequential model with seven convolution layers and two batch normalizing layers. And in the end, it's two fully connect dense layers. Uh, because uh, we usually, uh, we, we mainly do a binary classification with a limit class actually two classes so I we don't think we need two complicated uh, models and in my opinion this is a, also a typical issues in the research area because people always want to uh, develop a universal uh, convolution neural network to solve any problems that means you can use this model to classify anything from human to animal, from animal to cars to car to uh, some uh, nat uh, nat natural ph phenomena, which is uh, will uh, significantly increase the uh, runtime causes. And actually for a specific problem, a network with this relatively simple architecture can get very good performance. Next, we'll talk about uh, the tools for implement deep learning. So um, there's many li deep learning libraries in the market nowadays compared to last year because uh, last year people still talking about uh, talking about JavaScript because uh, from here we should see others because there's a Comlet JS uh, deep learning model for JavaScript but uh, using a browser to to compute deep learning is not uh, is unrealistic. So nowadays people will use the codes uh, by C++ as the backend and we use uh, Python to configure the uh, computation graph to call the C++ code under the hood. So by this solution we saw we can solve two problems. First 
is we can make our Python code to become more understandable by human because closer to uh, human language. The second is uh, we don't need a very complicated uh, mathematical background to preferably learning because uh, you simply draw the computational graph and ask the C call the C code and C functions to execute the uh, deep learning computation. Uh, so we can use uh, Python. There's so many tools uh, under Python, including the Google TensorFlow. And the carrots are also developed by Google as the um, APIs to call different uh, backend libraries, including uh, TensorFlow, Fiano, and CNTK by Microsoft. So they don't need to argue which is the best because you use uh, carrots, you can call uh, either uh, any of them. And if you want to code Java directly, uh, there's a library called Deep Learning for J, which have uh, three core libraries, including the first one is Deep Learning for J to for deep learning, and the next two is for matrix computation, which believe uh, to be a very good uh, matrix uh, manipulation library comparable to MATLAB. Uh, C++ is the uh, classic uh, languages, uh, like the Cafe by UC Berkeley, uh, still runs very good. And it's also because uh, the, I mean, the Cafe is support Python, it has a Python API, MATLAB API, and Qt API. So it's a very good choice. And in the MATLAB, you can have a community toolbox like Metcom Lab uh, by developed by uh, independent developers and you can also use the MATLAB uh, official new network toolbox which can also use deep learning. Other choice like Torch which is use a, a, a non-typical language called Lua and you can use uh, NCOT which is a C sharp uh, library. If people uh, prefer to work with Microsoft, NCOT will be a good choice but uh, the issue is uh, uh, the C sharp code is not very good for a convolutional neural network. And here the diagram says we input our image and we use the deep learning library to implement it based on deep learning for J and Android Studio to develop our applications. So this is the pipeline. Uh, uh, basically, we, uh, we separated the engineering pipeline in the two stages. The first one is training stage, which means we train the uh, CNN classifier. So in this case, we use uh, Python with uh, TensorFlow and Keras for the training. And we also use uh, the Java library Dylan for j to, uh, to save the uh, train model in a Android understandable uh, format. And the uh, second stage is called deployment stage. We use Android Studio with uh, Deep Learning for J to deploy our train model uh, into uh, on the uh, Android device. Another uh, solution is use the C++ code directly with TensorFlow. This is the way how Google do deep learning. Uh, in their life, in in their uh, development team, but uh, they don't provide API for uh, free uses. So uh, this is a fast way, but the more complicated way, as I show here. This is software option we choose. First, we choose Keras uh, with uh, TensorFlow. You can choose other libraries. There's no difference. And then we train. We run, uh, 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 configure the model and train the model by the image data. And the train model will be saved in uh, JSON format for the uh, model architecture. And the train weights will be saved to the uh, HDF5 format. Uh, the advantage to separate the model architecture and the way is that we can use the same model to trade different set of ways. That means we can use the same architecture to classify different, uh, to, to prefer different tasks. 
Another option is that uh, you can also trade the model with uh, the written in uh, most efficient languages. For example, here's the Python code to uh, configure a Keras model for uh, deep learning. We simply use a very simple code to add extra, uh, new layers to the uh, model by, uh, by uh, defining how many filters we use and the size of the filter. So it's very easy to learn and very easy to implement. Regarding the training data, uh, now we can save uh, the images into different subfolders in a training set or text set. So uh, the library can read or it literally read all the image file and, can, and, and to form the, uh, uh, the image array in, uh, as, as a data structure inside the training. So it's very convenient. Know that for cameras, we can also set a uh, validation set in order to uh, suppress um, uh, overfitting. So in addition, um, if you use TensorFlow, it will provide uh, many data visualization tools called TensorFlow. So you can visualize your model and you can record the uh, training progress during the whole training. And also in, uh, in Java, we can use a similar UI to monitor the training because when people are doing deep learning, you're going to know that it's very important to observe the training procedure for at least one hour because uh, you need to observe if the training is still convergent. So in our experiments, we run a uh, tenfold cost validation for our training set with 27,578 images, respectively with uh, TensorFlow and Deep Learning for J. The reason to do this comparison is that uh, because the output of the two different libraries are similar, so we have reason to believe that our uh, proposed model is uh, stable and robust. Another thing is that actually this year, our, I mean 2007, we have a lower accuracy compared to last year. The reason is that we find that last year our data partition had some issues because uh, the, the blood image from the same patient, have, because we're doing randomization, will be uh, assigned to both the uh, training set and the text set and this uh, setting will cause some potential bias. So this year, when we partition uh, uh, the training data, we make sure that uh, the blood image from the same patient will be show up in only one data set, that means either in training set and testing set. So although the uh, accuracy is a little bit lower, but um, we have, uh, uh, we have a uh, robust performance in our in our um, wet labs for I mean uh, to use new uh, blood image for do a uh, real classification in the uh, clinical setting. So here I show the uh, train model, which is, has been saved in Android Studio and deploy to the uh, Android app. It's very easy to do it because uh, if you use Android Studio, you can add um, this code and Android Studio will automatically uh, download the uh, Deep Learning for J library inside Android Studio. And another thing is I use a Android emulator for the initial text and I choose uh, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio uh, Emulator. The advantage of using a Microsoft M Emulator is that you don't need to install the hex program that is to solve the, pro the discrepancy of a uh, x86 uh, uh, CPU with a Android CPU will be, which will potentially 
destroy your operation system sooner or later. Uh, by using the Microsoft emulator, you don't need to uh, install the uh, hex library. So this is uh, the demo of our final uh, product. So on the emulator, we show we, we find that the runtime for classification is just 15% of the runtime for loading a file, which means uh, the classification is not quite expensive is uh, acceptable to to do classification because we know that a deep net, the computation through a deep neural network usually will cause more time compared to some shallow models like SVM or uh, the ESA models but here we saw that uh, it's not quite expensive it's still acceptable so we can use the deep learning for um, classification which is uh, quite economical. So this is our final product. We see that we deploy an Android app on a real smartphone. And here is the uh, image, uh, the, the block, uh, block cell image stored in the uh, smartphone. So by running, by low one single file and prefer the classification, first we can detect which cells are infected cells and we can also count how many uh, infected red blood cells from this image. So the progress, uh, so our malaria early alarm project is supported by both uh, ANSWER, ADISIMS, and NIH intramural funding since the year 2016. An extensive research collaborative network has been established around Canada USA, Bangladesh, Thailand, and Kenya. Our research uh, partners include York University, which is uh, the PI of uh, the Answer Addison project. Uh, we can uh, we still build a partnership with uh, National Library of Medicine, which is a branch of uh, a member of NIH. It's also another one is called National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, or NI. AID, which is also uh, a part of NIH. And we also have a collaboration with uh, University of Missouri and the uh, Mandel Oxford University in Thailand. They are mainly responsible for the wet lab, that means uh, to annotate it and extract the malaria red blood cells and provide a training data, a perfect training data set for our uh, research. Uh, one paper has been published in 2016 and has been inside the uh, NIH uh, uh, a data repository. Uh, this is a, a research demonstration in the University of the District of Columbia uh, last year, mainly to do a demonstration of our malaria uh, application on running on the Android device. And, uh, and uh, Android app based on deep convolution neural network algorithm is developed for uh, malaria infected uh, blood cell classification and counting. The new app is being tested in Southern Asia and Africa for its uh, to uh, for the data of its accuracy and reliability. The trace and uh, convolution neural network classifier can be transferred for other image-based uh, rapid diagnosis tests such as uh, biocide image screening for female cervical cancer, liver cancer, and x-ray fast screening for tuberculosis and breast cancer diagnosis. And so based on our work, a standard workflow and software platform for deep learning has been established in York University for multiple choice uh, tasks because the live platform of malaria uh, because of this work, the life threat of malaria will be uh, reduced and the vulnerable population, typical children in uh, underdeveloped regions, can be saved. So, in our conclusions, uh, deep learning is proved to be an accurate and reliable machine learning model for histopathological image classification, such as uh, malaria affected red blood cells. A trace CNN classifier can be run if efficiently on a mobile device. 
the straight feature input of the deep neural network model has uh, some potential faults because the machine can misclassify image with confidence as I show here uh, because the misclassify is the, actually the machine shows that uh, the machine is confident that their choice is correct but like uh, one to zero with their probability but actually they classify is wrong however we find that CNN has some drawbacks because uh, based on the um, raw image input uh, this cell has some shade inside that will be uh, extracted as a malaria but however uh, it's not to solve this problem we cannot uh, improve our classifier by uh, by by optimizing uh, the architecture of the deep learning model but to trade the data for example we uh, transfer the binding classification to a multi uh, class classification uh, can solve this problem which means um, some problem on machine learning cannot be solved by pure mathematics or by computer science only but you need to have feedback from the real setting in order to figure out that's something beyond the uh, theoretical framework therefore we need to build more complicated models such as a two-step multi-class module to overcome these issues because this misclassified image can be a new class so we need to extract it so this is the end of the presentation and this is uh, the answer uh, Edison program uh, a collaboration uh, between your university and uh, National Library uh, Institute of Health and this uh, my my picture in my uh, research work in the Bethesda camp campus in uh, NIH this is our paid, uh, poster on the uh, field trip big data conference in September this year in uh, University of Toronto and this is a uh, Rather than a picture of our uh, answer Addison program. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, this is question time. I would like to uh, uh, give you some time to ask question. Uh, standing. Mm. Mm. So. Can you go back to the slide where you had the results of your model, the TensorFlow versus, As well. yeah. Why do you think there is a slight improvement in the DL for J versus the TensorFlow? Could it be just the implementation, your implementation differences, or is that something that you think there is inherent into these uh, different frameworks? Do you have any insight into that? Well, actually, this tool library has a little bit different because uh, if you use a method theory that the DL, uh, deep learning for J library just like a like a car with a manual shift, and the attention flow is like a automatical shift, which means um, tension flow has more developed value when you choose different algorithms. But uh, in Tencent, in the DL4J, actually you need to manually configure all the parameter for the model. So if you just rely on the default uh, numbers, so the training will be a little bit different. This can be one explanation regarding why there's still some discrepancies between. Mm. So, but uh, if, you want to have a further control of your training, probably you can uh, remove the default parameters and set the value one by one manually. I see. And another thing is, it's interesting that the difference is not that much. The only difference is on the test one. The rest of them are not that significant. But uh, another question is the uh, your deployment way of the way you decided to deploy. 
the what exactly are you, from the model are you deploying? Are you deploying the entire model or just the inference part? Usually, uh, we deploy this part. Deploy this part because in the alpha J, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the advantage of the alpha J is that the output of the train model will be a zip file. After inside is two. One is for the architecture, the same as a JSON, and one is a binary. So uh, because my uh, application is based on the alpha J, so I use a desktop to train a classifier with the weights, and then I put this train model inside Android Studio. That is my question. Why are you putting the train model there? Do you need the train model or you just need the model that does the inference? Do you just you just need to refer to the model? You don't need the training model there. You don't need to train the model inside the smartphone. You only need to train PLC and then say the ways and put this to the uh, smartphone and you simply call your train model by DL4J code and then you can do the uh, classification mm -hmm. uh, for new images. Mm -hmm. How big was it? Do you remember? Uh, it depends on the capacity of the model, usually 2, uh, two to 3 mm -hmm. megabytes. 2 to 3 megabytes? Yes. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you. Well, because uh, would you mind going back to like your accuracy um, that page? Yeah, like mm -hmm. I saw like everything um, you use, like the, the database mm -hmm. you use is basically uh, 27,000 something images. Mm -hmm. Like are they all from, because um, I saw like you were saying like um, from s Southeastern um, like Thai, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, and Kenya from Africa, are these images, like these um, images all from that area? Because like, um, what I was thinking is, is it possible that the malaria in these certain areas fall into certain uh, classification, um, like a type, what I mean? Like, yeah. Yes, uh, because actually from here, you, you can find that malaria uh, blood image because uh, by use by processing the blood smears actually from different lab they will look different. But the advantage of a convolution neural network is that uh, a convolution neural network they recognize the visual patterns not by color, but by the edges and angles. Therefore. Uh, based on this theory, uh, though the color is different, but they will be filtered out as background noise by a series of convolutional operations. And the pattern that counts for uh, classification <coughs> is the uh, shade and edges. That's why we can help and we, we're not going to uh, Noise, get noise by uh, the plectins from a specific region. That's one aspect. The second is whether or not our data is big enough. Because uh, because they are malaria, first of all, they're malaria, so they should have some degree of similarity. So if our image database of training set is big enough and is from uh, multi places, they will have they will help the uh, classifier to build a the, cap the capacity of the generalization that can recognize the common features of this kind of disease. Okay, so like um, usually for like disease studies, like how big is big? You know what I mean? Like how big is what you said is big enough to like get to uh, represent different areas versus like uh, the different maybe classifications, classification groups? Uh, first of all, you know that um, 
the image is quite expensive because you need manual segmentation and annotation to form in order to form the um, training set which means we need to hire medical students like from Kenya, from Bangladesh, from University of Missouri working with us to manually segment the blood cells and also annotate which one is a normal blood cell, which one is a infective, infective blood cells that will cost time and the reason that why uh, by the number in each partition is equal because it's easier to get normal blood cells than infect blood cells so our target is to you try our best to use all the blood cells uh, all the infective uh, infected blood cells and find the normal blood cells to match them in number that's why uh, there's some small difference in each flow for in the cost validation so you, uh, i can see the the unique things for your project is uh, actually we are standing on the uh, shoulder of the young people uh, the nih people collect the data and also yeah. do the labeling uh, it's a huge amount of work actually so what you do is you gather the label data golden standard and also data they collect it so that you can make your research progress much faster than other people so as you can see actually when many other people do the research they don't really have the data they actually ask your guys to collect the data but it's really hard because only a few people in a few days come and collect a large number of data which is meaningful research so i'm glad to see that you can work with the NIH and uh, get some data to do some meaningful work thank you yeah. so i have a question about the um app that you're using yeah how fast it is like once you collect the blood test, how fast is no, how like fast? if you're getting a blood sample, right? Mm. How fast yeah. is it detect if that blood is infected? Like it has infected well, cells or not? It's like uh, five seconds. So the issue is when when you use a light microscope to classify manually because we just have a few people can work as the uh, doctors or technicians so there's the the word pleasure is much higher because people are emotional creatures right so by replace human manpower with machines we can do it with a stable uh, speed and as far as we have uh, enough uh, smartphone, uh, you so can do parallel. So in five seconds, you can say if someone has malaria or not. Like five seconds for one counting, as I show you here. Like, put, take a picture by, uh, right. by, by the cell phone, and then it will count. So the most important thing is the number, because for a single microscopic view, you need to get the counting of how many infected cells inside this wheel right so so we know for example like from my point of view um when i'm working on um for example people coming from play or for a train in canada right there are a lot of people having asymptomatic diseases so this kind of application can actually tell me if i'm collecting the samples of people from in, uh, coming from i don't know Bangladesh, for example, where malaria is in, um, endemic, they can tell me in five seconds if that person has the malaria or not. Uh, you need to do the blood work and you need to make the blood smear and then. So it cannot be immediate. Like, it's not like when they go to immigration, I can just collect the sample and say, okay, yeah. maybe you need urgent medical and healthcare because you're positive or I don't know. Uh, because there's a bottleneck in the diagnosis because uh, collecting uh, samples and making the blood smear is uh, much faster than uh, doing the diagnosis so the bottleneck is this stage if uh, there's too many samples collected from many patients and they are waiting there to determine whether or not they have this diagnosis so medication cannot be prescribed because they're waiting the doctor waiting for diagnosis by doing this 
we can get the result of diagnosis as far as as far as possible as soon as possible so the medication will be delivered to the patient on time and the prognosis will be more. Uh, I also have a question uh, you know uh, in the past uh, about five to ten years uh, the advance of uh, uh, deep learning techniques has a significant advanced uh, uh, multimedia data such as image data research uh, for image research for example, like image classification, as you did right now. So my question is, uh, so uh, how do you enhance the accuracy of the deep learning uh, algorithm? Uh, does, does it mean uh, a more a complex model uh, can provide a better performance? Or it doesn't really matter? Because mo most people believe maybe more complex model will produce better results. But this may uh, may produce uh, increase the complexity of your algorithm. Uh, for example, when you try to use a mobile phone to do some prediction for malaria disease, uh, if the model is too complicated or take too much resources, the cell phone may not be able to handle it. So how do you uh, answer this question? So I think first thing is uh, the complexity of the classification problem matters because. Uh, the research, in the research field, people uh, believe by using a more complex architecture, uh, the model will have uh, more capacity to learn patterns and prefer very large multi-class classification. So for a uni so-called universal model that can be used to classify anything, uh, the model can be very complicated. But when we move to specific problems, we don't need uh, to use very complicated uh, architecture like this example. Um, second is uh, more, the more complex the model is, the more time we can expect for the computation. Therefore, if we decide very complicated model, actually um, it cannot be used to, uh, on a mobile device which has only limited uh, com computation capacity. Um, I think the most important thing is uh, that's how deep learning works is that we need the people who uh, design a suitable architecture, the uh, neural network architecture, but we also need to take time to observe the training because it's a specific uh, threshold and deep learning usually takes time. I mean, I, if you use a very large data set, usually you will learn it needs to be run like several hours or several days and the improvement can be generated after like 10 tables or 20 tables so uh, like in the, at the beginning of this year people like in Keras they have like setting an early stop to terminate the training automatically after there's no improvement in several uh, training tables actually I, in my opinion it, it makes no sense because usually the improvement can be made after 10 or 20 APOPs. So uh, manpower matters in, in deep learning because you need people to design the architecture and observe the training. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Maybe only one two. Uh, just out of curiosity, what type of uh, hardware did you guys use and how long the training took? Well, I think hardware also play a very important role. For example, if you use um, a GPU, the RAM of GPU matters because uh, the setting of the uh, deep learning library, they can, after that, prefer the computation. If too much data there and they will cause a leak and that will ruin your whole program but uh, nowadays we have cloud computing you can like launch a ec2 virtual machine on amazon with a reasonable price and you can apply gpu and they will have mechanism to efficiently partition do efficient partition so uh, it's 
very good for a large data set. Uh, this data set is not very large, so I use a uh, four gigabyte um, GPU RAM is enough. But I almost hit the edge because I set the uh, like the batch size for the uh, uh, stochastic gradient set. I if it, I set a, a, a aggressive like five hundred uh, image uh, per per run. Uh, it will cause some problem. So uh, running stochastic gradient descent, the way is we can uh, efficiently control the size for each iteration. So we can save the hardware resource and make our program more executable in uh, ordinary machines. Okay, one last question. Okay. Uh, so in one of the, your slides, you mentioned that uh, uh, there exists uh, more than a few different uh, implementations using different programming languages, like Python, Java, C++, and others. So I was wondering like, uh, which one of the specific tools that you actually picked up, and what, is, what are the reasons that uh, you made such kind of uh, choice? Well, in this project, uh, because our ultimate goal is to make an Android application and the most efficient why we pick um, DL4J and also port like model transfer from Python to uh, DL4J so we pick a TensorFlow with Keras as the comparison with uh, DeepLearning4J in order to uh, deploy our application on an uh, Android device. So you picked up uh, Java-based? Uh... Uh, picking Java-based is uh, a feasible solution for an yeah. uh, Android device. Okay. So uh, what if, like, I'm, I'm just uh, curious if you, like, uh, uh, deploy, deploy the same, same kind of uh, um, application into some other platform, like using C++, C++ and Python, would you expect that uh, you will get exactly the same results or uh, similar results? Because we run the TensorFlow cost validation on oh. both uh, TensorFlow oh. and, uh, ja and the DL4J library, okay. Okay. so they are totally separated. So as, as you show that with our data, we have very close performance, so okay. we're confident that uh, the outcome is stable. They're, so they're comparable? Yeah. Oh, okay, good, good, thank you. Okay, okay so uh, I would like to uh, summarize our, our seminar today. So first, thanks, uh, Stanley, for your talk. Uh, it's interesting, uh, particularly interesting about using uh, deep learning uh, techniques for building uh, an early alarm system for m malaria, malaria disease. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very important and uh, useful. Uh, we actually uh, have uh, uh, planned a series of uh, uh, trainee seminars for, from our answer create uh, program participate, uh, such as from uh, uh, McMaster University, Western University, uh, Ryerson, uh, Calgary, and uh, uh, Montreal. Uh, and uh, in the in the next few months, so uh, as, as as far as I know, uh, our program manager has told me um, in the next few months, uh, Sandra uh, will uh, give a talk uh, about uh, his uh, uh, forced migration project using big data techniques. Uh, so uh, Sandra's talk um, uh, will be titled uh, "Exploring uh, Forced Migration Signal uh, in Large Media Archive." And also, Alina uh, will give a talk uh, quickly, as far as I know, uh, about mathematical modeling in matter population. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will have such a talk every few weeks, uh, no more than a month. And uh, I will be happy to, uh, to come and listen to, to see your research achievement. Uh, thanks for your coming. It's great to see all of you.